memory forgetting. Now we're on to uh, other parts of card cognition. So we'll start with, I think, problem solving, uh, judgment errors, which are also just problem solving errors, and uh, creativity. We'll probably only get through part of problem solving today, though. So this is the next notebook page, I think it's 17, uh, and that's uh, other forms of cognition. And uh, today we'll uh, focus on problem solving. I'll probably continue there tomorrow. Hopefully, can wrap up judgment, creativity, and uh, language tomorrow. Probably can. If not, I'll finish it on Friday before the quiz and the work you on. It's problem solving. Uh, this is something that, well, there are many animals that have some capacity to problem solve, but humans have the most advanced problem solving capabilities. So most of your problem solving, in fact, if, if not all of it, takes place up in your frontal lobe. So uh, people that are good at problem solving are uh, essentially the people with high, high, uh, high intelligence, high IQs for the most part. Because uh, problem solving is dependent on, 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 few, on several factors. Um, number one, you have to be able to recognize a problem and you have to be able to, uh, based on your knowledge of uh, patterns and understanding of that problem, be able to think of a possible solution that either can uh, improve or uh, completely solve that actual problem. And that takes a high degree of understanding. So you've got to be someone who can take in a lot of information, remember the patterns uh, and sequences, and even maybe use creativity to come up with their own new sequence or pattern uh, that can see the problem correctly, find a solution, and implement the solution. Uh, it takes a high degree of, of understanding and intelligence. So can we close that door, please? Uh, generally problem solving, the people that are better at it, that's just, um, they have higher IQs. But all humans have a degree of problem solving ability uh, because that's part of us as humans, it's part of our frontal lobe region. So problem solving, uh, again, you have to recognize it and try to come up with a solution. So there's a few approaches. Uh, there's two approaches you can take to it, uh, and that are uh, these two. So there's the algorithmic approach. and there's the heuristic approach. The most common one for humans by far is the heuristic approach, and it's a pretty good one because uh, it's pretty reliable and it's definitely the quickest. Uh, and here's why. This is a more, humans definitely do and can use this, uh, but this is a better one for like computers because they can do things so quickly. So a, an algorithmic approach is going through uh, all possible uh, solutions and pathways. So, for example, if I was like, uh, let's say we don't use textbooks in here because they suck, but let's pretend, or think about a class you do. What's the class you do? Probably chemistry or math, right? A push. A push, there we go. Good old pangy. All right, so uh, use the, the textbook there, and you're like, oh, I got a question, or I'm studying for um, uh, a section on reconstruction in US history. So uh, you're like, yes, I am. Um, so uh, it's in the textbook, the section on, on reconstruction. Or let's say it's a topic. Let's say it's the black codes, all right, or, or Jim Crow or something like that. Uh, so it's a specific topic. I can't just look up a chapter title and be like, oh, there's the black codes section because it's not there, right? It's, a, it's in one of those chapters. So a, an algorithmic approach would be, well, I don't know exactly where it is, so to find the section on the black codes or Jim Crow, whatever it might be from Reconstruction Era or just after it, uh, I would go through every single page and every paragraph looking for that. That would be the algorithmic approach. I'd start from page one and go through every paragraph looking for the word. All right, is that the fastest way to do it? Absolutely, Absolutely not. Uh, would I find the term eventually? Yes. Absolutely, unless I was just not paying attention at some point, but yeah, or I didn't turn a page, the guy got stuck there, whatever. Assuming I correctly read all the pages, I will eventually find it, but it's a very long process because we humans kind of can only process information so quickly. So that's, that's algorithmic. What would a heuristic approach be then? Kind of like a, essentially an educated guess. You get to the page in the title where it starts with the reconstruction or after the Yeah, so I'd be like, okay, well I know that it's gonna be in this era roughly, it's a reconstruction topic right after the Civil War. Uh, so uh, I would look for the chapter section about that follows the Civil War or Reconstruction specifically or, or ones that are around it. And then I would look in that section, right? Would that save me time? Mm -hmm. yes. Absolutely, right? I go to that section, look, oh, there it is, you know, four pages in or whatever, and I save myself like two hours of going through all of US history looking for this, for this term. All right, so this is uh, um, 
for lack of a better way of phrasing it, an educated guess uh, based on your understanding. Can I always use a heuristic? Not always, right? So sometimes I do have to go the al algorithmic approach. Um, but the way that we set things up, and this is partly Gestalt principles, is we put things together that are associated. So if you know what the topic is associated with, you can assume that it's in the section that has similar things. You can go to that section and find it much quicker, uh, more quickly. So uh, you, you, I think I have a food example in there. It's like chili sauce or salsa or something, right? Something like that. So let's say I go to the store and uh, I have to get salsa. Like I don't get salsa that often. Um, and it's a new grocery store. Like it's not one that I'm familiar with. So I go into the grocery store. Um, if I wanted to find the salsa, what would be the algorithmic approach for finding the salsa? Somebody explain that to me. You were first technically, sorry. Yeah, or right to left, it doesn't matter. I could start wherever, but I'd want to cover, I'll like start on one side or the other. I'd go up and down every aisle looking through for salsa. Okay, would that find me the salsa? Yes. yes, it would. Okay, if it was there, but we'd assume that the grocery store has that. What would be the heuristic approach then? Now I'll get you. So say, because you're looking for a sauce, say you see mm -hmm. ketchup might be or something in the aisle, you go down that aisle saying, Yeah, I said salsa, but yeah, if you're looking for chili sauce, yeah, that's like a condiment. Yeah, so I, I, I would probably start looking in the aisle with condiments or maybe, uh, uh, is, that, is that a Pacific Islander thing? or Because I know that's where the people that, 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 I found out about it from a Filipino family and it was delicious. Uh, but I don't know if that's the culture that it's from. But yeah, I, I could try to uh, think about what type of ethnic food it is and go to that ethnic food aisle or, or whatever as well. Like it was salsa. Uh, I, I would go to the area with the chips, probably, and if I didn't find it there, maybe the Hispanic aisle has it. I'm assuming it comes from Hispanic culture, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, that's where I would guess based on my knowledge of it. Uh, so um, that would be the heuristic approach to finding something. Usually that's quicker, right? But if I, let's say I do that option and I go to those places and it's not there for whatever reason because somebody stupidly put it somewhere else, what am I going to have to do? You can ask an employee. Let's assume we can't do that. You'd have to go with the algorithmic approach. Some people can't ask employees because they're so crippled by social anxiety they don't want to bother them. Uh, so, or or even they're just so agreeable they don't want to they don't want to like you know distract them from their job or frustrate them. I, that, that was my wife. She's she's not socially anxious at all. She's super extroverted, but she never wants to ask employees stuff because she doesn't want to bother them because they're working. And I'm like, dude, she's like, where's this thing? And then I go up and they're like, in aisle three, is like, ta-da! And then we just go to aisle three. But you know, that's that's a temperament uh, difference. We'll talk about that with with personality later. So that's the heuristic approach. However, I could, and we've talked about this before, I could come up with an idea or a solution just out of thin air after I've thought about it and slept on it and all that stuff, and we've talked about this before, uh, what would that be called? Insight. Insight, right, like a light bulb moment. Like I sleep on it and you know, I think of a witty retort later on, like, oh, I should have said this, you know, come up with it. Or like, I can't figure out what I wanna do with my furniture arrangement or whatever, uh, which none of you have thought about, I'm sure, but, uh, <coughs> but you will at some point. Uh, you might be like, I don't know, I could try this, I don't like this one, and all of a sudden, you have this idea of a perfect way to arrange it so that this thing is over here and it's out of the sunlight and there's a glare on the screen here and the bed, like, that, that sort of thing could just come to you out of nowhere, right? And that's an insight. So this is something that uh, we can't predict necessarily, uh, and these are just sudden realizations of a solution. They often come uh, when you have a good understanding of the topic or you've thought about it, maybe you've dreamed about it without knowing about it and thought about a problem or a solution to the problem or whatever, and it just comes to you later. So I wouldn't bank on always having these, but uh, they do show up from time to time, some for more than others. Uh, we'll talk about creativity later, because uh, creativity and problem solving are almost identical. It's just that creativity is like you solve a problem or, or meet a, a desire, uh, but it's in a way that nobody else has before, which makes it harder to do, but it's very, very similar. All right, you can pack it up. We'll continue tomorrow with that. The uh, reason why I had you do that was for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is when we talk about um, a mental set or functional fix fixedness. This is two ways where your, your brain, as far as problem solving goes, gets kind of stuck. So um, there's two phenomena here. So these are our, all, all of our approaches, right? Algorithmic, going through all the options, heuristic, 
basically taking an educated guess as to where you think it would likely be based on associations and your knowledge. Uh, or insight randomly just coming to you. Uh, so ways you can kind of get tripped up are, first of all, uh, a mental set uh, can stymie or slow down your ability to think of uh, different options or solutions uh, to a problem. So, for example, this is when, uh, if I gave you a, a problem like, hey, how can we, what are all the ways we can get this refrigerator to the third story of a, of a building, right? You'd probably think of like two or three or four right off the bat, and then what would happen? You'd get stuck, right? And you'd probably keep looping and thinking the same things. Uh, that's called a mental set. When you can only think of like one or two or three different ways to solve a problem, but you can't think of another um, um, option without maybe later an insight or maybe somebody else shares a, a, a perspective or opinion and all of a sudden you go, oh, like when I told you about the smashing, uh, the, the using a brick to open a wall, and you know, somebody like, oh, die. That'll all of a sudden unlock a bunch of different uh, um, thoughts uh, about how you can use it too. So again, a mental set is just where you're, uh, it's, a, it's a way you get stuck uh, in your own uh, problem solving methods. And you can think of others. Like I said, later it can come as an insight or uh, you could hear, thank you, you could hear an idea, uh, you could hear an idea from somebody else that helps you unlock or see a new perspective. Uh, but that's what a mental set is. So that's one reason why I had you do the, uh, the brick activity. Uh, that's when I, I saw online and I saw it happen. I was like, oh, I'm going to try this. So I, I did it myself and I had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, but that's, uh, that, that's one way. So here's another way, by, by the way, that we can do really quickly. Uh, for this one, do not share with your neighbor what you're thinking. All right. I'm going to put a pattern and we'll see if you guys can determine what the following numbers or letters are in this pattern. Again, don't vocalize what you're thinking. Don't write it down. Just try to solve it in your head. So here's a pattern. It's going to be very bored for this part. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They'll try it out too, probably. I see a lot of confused faces. This is good. <laughs> Hands go up. What? Is it on the notes? Yeah. Oh, what? I forgot I put it on the yeah. notes. Oh, it was on the Dang yeah, it. What is it? Okay, well, for those of you that uh, don't remember it from the notes. Okay, wait. Who doesn't remember it from the notes, but thinks they solved it? It's hard to trust that, but what do you think it is? F. Why? Because what if, on the other side, there's also another J? <laughs> so if you think about it, this has to be a... <laughs> so the pattern is J-J-F-M-A-M-J-J-F-M-A-M-J-F-M-A-M-J-F-M-A-M-J-F-M-A-M-J-F-M-A-M-J-F-M-A-M-J-F-M-A-M-J-F-M-A-M-J-F-M-
The other one you could use, once you know that that's a way to look at this problem, is, oh, those may not just be a pattern, but they might actually represent, you know, the first letter of something. And that would make it much more easy to uh, solve this next one. I know, it wasn't the notes, but these are the, for the half of you that forgot about that. <laughs> what? Yep, why is it S? Because it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then S is Yep, so that's when you're, uh, once you know that you can think about it as, oh, possibly these are the first letter of some uh, uh, ordered sequence, uh, it's easier to look for that and see, oh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6 would be the S, and then be another S for 7, all the way down, right? Um, that's, what it's, that's what it's like. So the first time you look at it, and again, I kind of ruined it by putting on the notes. I forgot about that. Um, those you look at it first, you're, you're really stuck on trying to figure out the letters. But then when you realize, oh, I can substitute the, uh, or it can represent a word, then all of a sudden that opens up a new way of thinking. Or the second time you look at the new numbers, or the new letters, you don't just look at the letter sequence. You're like, okay, what could those represent that would be in order? Uh, and then that makes it much more easy to come to the conclusion that that's one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way down. Uh, so it'd be S as the option. All right, so that's an example of mental sets, a new way of thinking about something. And it's really hard to create your own. It can happen, you can have insight moments, uh, but it's really hard to just like come up with new options because your brain has a way of looking at it and it gets kind of stuck in that one way of looking at it. It's hard to get out of that. That's why it's really good to uh, think about things for a long time, so in case you do have your own insights, but also it's a good idea to uh, discuss it or listen to the ideas of others because they can give you a new way of looking at things, right? Um, functional fixedness, though, can also be uh, something that makes it harder to problem solve because, and this is what, uh, by the way, separates us currently from uh, computers like AI, artificial intelligence, as well as all other animals for the most part, um, is that we can actually perceive things for more than just what we understand their role to be. And that didn't help you all, I'm sure. But I think the example I gave was a wrench or something, right? Yeah. Okay, so if I, well, we did, we did the brick already. Like, what is a brick for? What is that thing made for? Buildings. Yeah, buildings, right? You stick it in some mortar or whatever they call it, and then you, it dries and it, it forms a wall or a building or something like that or a road, right? That's what it's intended for. But can you use it for other things? Yes. You definitely can. That's kind of what we did, right? Uh, you can come up with a whole bunch of different ways. We got into the 20s, right, at least. Uh, and they can go much more than that uh, if you include other people uh, trying to figure it out. Um, when, though, I can't think of a use for an item other than its intended use, in this case it would be a brick, it's part of a building or a wall or whatever, uh, that's called functional fixedness. When uh, you're kind of stuck in it, somehow got a different color. Uh, when you're stuck in uh, imagining the item as only being used for that specific purpose, like the one it was designed for. So here's an example. Um, uh, well, I'm going to write this up here. Functional fixedness. All right, and that's the uh, that's difficulty or an ability in uh, perceiving other alternate uses for an item. All All right, so uh, I gave you the wrench example. Let's use a different one. Um, what's something else that it's hard to think of another way you could use it? Brick was a good one. What about uh, a hair dryer? It is made to dry hair, correct? What else could I use it for? You could use it as a crappy heater for a small room. Yes, that would technically work, right? Okay, what else? Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, you could use it as that. I'm not going to suggest that for the internet, but yes, you could. If your clothes are wet, just use it to dry or something. Yeah, that's kind of like the hair thing, but yeah, drying other things besides just your hair. Is that what you were going to say too? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Those are those are some examples. Machines can't do this yet. This is where uh, 
AI has not made the leap to uh, uh, reaching human levels of understanding because currently we got machines to uh, take in sensory information pretty quickly. Like I can have a machine scan a, a room and see the objects and how far away they are and all that. In fact, they can see spectrums of light and sounds that we can't detect at all. So they do, they have better senses than we do in, in some way. But what a machine can't do is they can't perceive well. So it's really hard for a machine to see things for their actual usefulness or to go beyond that. Like you have to program it in specifically. Hammer is for hammering nails. Unless I, unless I program it with other information, like you can also use it to smash glasses or something like that, it will only know how to use it for uh, uh, hammering nails, right? Similarly, like the chimpanzee, uh, they couldn't even figure out why they were washing the dish in the first place. All right, so that perception element is uh, uniquely human for the most part. Uh, as of right now. There's a few other animals that can do that. Like you've got killer whales that set traps, you know, for, for birds and things like that. Like there's that video, the one uh, uh, orca who uh, like takes the fish that they feed him uh, in his little tank. And he takes like the, he eats most of them, he saves a couple and then he throws them up like on the shallow end so that the birds come in to get it. And he just keeps eating the birds as they come in to get this uh, fish that's, that's laying there. Uh, so we know that some animals can think beyond that, but uh, for the most part, it's just us, at least with, a, with a, a developed ability to do that. But that's functional fixedness, when you have a really hard time seeing things beyond their, uh, their initial use. Right, you can do that for anything. A wrench, it's hard to initially think of other uses other than a wrench. And then you might go to, oh, it's just a blunt object you can smash things with, okay. But the further down you go, the harder it is to think of different ways to use it. All right, do you understand how uh, we can get kind of stuck as humans on these things? Cool. Uh, well, I'll bring up the brick example again when we get to creativity shortly. All right, so that's problem solving, and that's kind of some ways we can get stuck. Here's some bad problem solving, and this is, these are ones that I would recommend you guys uh, become aware of and just get rid of uh, almost altogether. The first one, I think that's what I go to next. I lost my sheet with the terms that I want to talk about. Hold on a second. <clears throat> You're going to have judgment next, right? That's not the sheet. That's also not the sheet. That's also not the sheet. That's also not the sheet. That's the sheet. Oh, yeah, judgment. That's next. Okay. Uh, judgment. Judgment is basically you assessing a situation, but these are poor judgment techniques, all right? Um, so you, you do use your judgment when you're trying to make a decision, like, should I do this or not? Right, you gotta think ahead, you potentially have to problem solve, you have to analyze factors and consider the patterns you know from your past understanding and try to figure out you know, what's gonna happen, what the best alternative is. That's judgment too, that's a good way of using judgment. These are uh, imperfect, beyond imperfect. These are actually, I would even say almost detrimental uh, judgments. These are ones that often cause more harm than they do good uh, because they are flawed. Uh, and so what we, why we use the scientific process of like, oh, set up an experiment, uh, prove that uh, it replicates, that it can actually, uh, uh, you know, correctly predict things consistently. That's how we know they're true, not just using these techniques uh, or falling victim to these fallacies. So judgments, I'll say poor judgments. All right, first one and the most common one, and this is all one that, in fact, someone asked me a question about this earlier in the year, like, uh, why do they say go with your gut feeling or whatever? They're very wrong. Um, that is uh, your intuition. And no, I am so sorry. I know a lot of you think that you have it or your mom has it or whoever has it, uh, but it's not intuition. No, your mom knows you did something wrong, not because moms just know. She knows because your body language is just screaming, I did something wrong and I'm super anxious, you're gonna catch me. You're acting weird. You're not looking at your, like breaking eye contact. You're all cluttered up. Your voice is all squeaky or whatever. Like they can tell that you're hiding something because it's written all over your body. They don't just magically know. If you were a, a, a good liar and knew how to hide it and not be anxious about it, they'd have no idea. All right, so that's not intuition. That's just, that's actually a, a form of your um, um, uh, dual processing. Cause I can unconsciously process what mood you're in or if you're anxious or not, uh, just by looking at you. And I can be like, that's not right. You're, you're not telling me the truth, right? And then you, then you catch on to it. So it's your fault, actually. 
right. Um, <clears throat> intuition. This is a, a, an instant, uh, I'm going to say thoughtless for the most part, uh, attitude or feeling about a situation. So it's instant judgment. Uh, it's not based on fact, it's based on your own feeling. So <clears throat> what you're essentially tapping into somewhat is it's, it's almost like an emotion, and sometimes it is an emotion. Um, these have historically, back in you know, pre-society when you know, it was everyone on, is on their own, hunter-gatherer, uh, even, even beyond before humans, when we didn't have like society and structures and tools and rules and things like that, these sorts of things helped us stay alive, so yay them. Uh, they are, however, not a good gauge for actually figuring out how things work or actually figuring out um, if somebody's guilty of a crime or not or uh, what I should do uh, with my future planning about this situation, about my job, about whatever. It is terrible for that. In fact, it's actually worse than just rolling a dice and randomly guessing uh, across time. I think I told you about that, right? They've tested, <clears throat> they've tested this on things like gambling. So those, those times when someone's like, oh yeah, it's, gonna be, it's, it's, it's 17 black, I can feel it, I know it. Uh, or it's um, <clears throat> picking a slot machine or uh, a non-gambling example would be they had people uh, listen to evidence or watch videos of somebody that was accused of a crime and they would of course d analyze whether they thought based on their intuition if they were guilty or not uh, and they are uh, wrong at about the same rate, if not a little lower than if they just randomly were picking who was guilty, who wasn't guilty, et cetera. Uh, and then gambling is even worse. So intuition is a terrible, terrible, terrible way to actually make a decision. And you might think, oh, I hardly ever do that. Actually, you do uh, a lot. There's some uh, uh, research by uh, a guy named Jonathan Haidt, Dr. Jonathan Haidt. And uh, he found this out about humans. He, and I can't believe it took us this long to figure it out, but he figured out not even 20 years ago, I think. Well, he was doing his research still, but 20-ish years ago, he figured out we don't actually make decisions. We don't actually, for the most part, we don't think about our actions or think about the consequences. What actually happens is something occurs, like you see something or somebody tells you something or you uh, hear about something, and you immediately have uh, a feeling come over you. It's usually an emotional response. So uh, it might be negative, it might be sad, it might be happy, it might be positive, whatever it might be. So whatever feeling we get, that immediately affects our perception. Uh, and then we oftentimes go with whatever that feeling is. And if you ask us why we chose that, we don't just say, because I felt it. We rationalize why we did it, all right? So it's not that we think about it calculatedly and we go, hmm, what's my best option? Or what do you think the actual answer is to this? Or what should I do? Or did this person actually mean that or not? We don't actually do that. We have an instant feeling and then we go with it. And then afterwards, we try to rationalize why we chose that. Uh, you essentially, I don't wanna say you're making things up, but you kind of are. Here's an example. Um, this is an example he gives in his book, by the way, which I forgot the name of for some reason. Yeah, I forgot the name of it. It's a good one though and I'll have to plug it later, uh, but I can't do it right now. Uh, it has to do with morality. Whatever. In his book, he gives an example. Uh, he, uh, he loves his family, obviously. He's got kids, uh, and he's got a wife. And uh, he was like getting up, he, was, he ate his breakfast, and he was going to work one day, and uh, his wife was overwhelmed with something, like the baby was doing something. Uh, and so she's like, hey, uh, uh, can you pick that up really quick and take the trash out? He's like, oh, no, I can't. I got to get going to work. I, I know, I'm going to be late. And so he left. And uh, later on, he was thinking about it. I mean, like right after he was thinking, he was like, why did I say that? He's like, I'm not actually late. If I, I could take 30 seconds to pick the stuff up and take the trash out with me. He's like, why didn't I? Why didn't he? He just didn't want to, right? So she asked the question. It was a situation. Um, and he just got that initial feeling like, ugh, I don't want to do that. That's annoying. So he said, oh, I can't. And then what did his brain do? Rationalized, Rationalized it, right. Uh, it wasn't that he was intentionally lying, but he did sort of lie. At least when he thought about it later, he was like, no, I, that 30 seconds didn't make me later not to work. Uh, so that's what we usually do. Uh, and we do that all the time, which is actually kind of scary if you think about it. Uh, because we don't actually think about what we do and make the best decision. We get a feeling. 
And then we just try to justify whatever our feeling was. And people don't actually realize this. And he's got a lot of really good work on uh, showing this, that it's not just you know, us here in the West, it's the entire world, and it goes way, way, way back further in time. Uh, so if you think you're this wonderful, objective person that doesn't make any rash decisions and isn't controlled by you know, primitive limbic system parts of their brain or their emotion, you're wrong. Uh, like 90% or more of what you do is just, you get a feeling, you do it, and then afterwards you try to uh, rationalize why you did it. All right, um, and that's a perception thing, uh, but that's nonetheless true. Oh, there's another good uh, example of this too, by the way, uh, that, that, that's similar. So you guys know that uh, anyone that's considered even remotely de like a Democrat just detests Trump. Uh, and on the same, uh, side, uh, but years earlier when it was Obama, most Republicans hated Obama or his policies, right? That's not a shock to you guys, correct? You're familiar with that? Okay, here's what they did. This is, this is so awesome. What they would do is they would go to uh, college campuses and like mall, shopping malls, places where there were people around, uh, and they would uh, ask them if they're Democrat or Republican, and they would, you know, they'd tell them. Uh, and what they would do is they had this list of things that uh, Obama had done and Trump had done, and normally, if I'm talking to a Democrat and it describes stuff that Trump's done, uh, they'll uh, think it's bad, right? Or if I'm a Republican, I describe stuff that Obama's done, they'll think it's bad. So what they did is they flipped it. They would find a Democrat, I'll use a Democrat as an example, I'll use a Republican. They'd find a Democrat and then they would say, oh, here's something Trump did, but guess what they would actually explain? It was something Obama did, right? And then they would go off about how terrible it was, how it was a bad idea, and how, that, how he's a terrible person. And they're like, actually, Obama did that. And I'd be like, oh. And they didn't realize that they're not even listening to what the thing is. Like, once they think it's this person they hate, they automatically switch on their whatever's coming next sucks part in their brain. So they hear it, and they say it sucks, and they talk about why it sucks. But they're not actually thinking about why it sucks. What are they doing? They're just justifying and rationalizing their initial thought and feeling, right? The, the exact same thing in the reverse, by the way. If they go up to a Republican and describe something that's Republican from Bush or Trump or whatever, uh, but they say Obama did it, they talk about how terrible it is and how they detest it, and they find out, oh, actually, uh, it was uh, someone from your party that, that suggested this. And it works, again, the opposite. They can also take things that are good, like let's say they, uh, uh, they, they take something Trump did and talk to a Democrat, and, but they uh, describe it as an Obama policy. And the Democrat, like, oh, that's wonderful, and this is why, and he's a good person. All that's like, oh, actually, Trump did that. And they're like, oh, and they get this, you know, look. And they do the exact same thing in reverse. They go up and describe something Obama did, but say it was like Trump or Bush to Republican, and they say it's wonderful. It's like, oh, actually, Obama did that. Uh, and then they, it, it sort of catches them uh, in the reverse. So there's no question, and there's lots, there's endless different ways we can point this out, but just be aware of that. Uh, if you're ever actually having to think about something, and make a decision, uh, really think about if you're making that decision because most of what you do is dictated by your perception, which is an instantaneous reaction to whatever your emotional uh, trigger was. So oftentimes, if you're making a decision, it's best to just wait and think about it and think, okay, did I just make a decision and rationalize it or is this actually the, uh, the best decision to make? All right, intuition's a terrible mechanism. It's a terrible way to uh, live your life uh, based on what you feel is right and all of that. If you feel it's right, great. Try to figure out why you feel it's right. And also, try to pretend why you might be wrong. Ask yourself that. Could I be deadly wrong about this? Like, could I be horribly wrong about this and, and try to find out? And then if you look into the other uh, perspective or any alternatives, you'll often find that, oh, there probably are some things I overlooked just because I favor this uh, position or decision uh, going forward. So I don't care what your political affiliations are or religious affiliations are, uh, just make sure to try to do that as you go through life. Um, you'll have these feelings and thoughts, but you should step back and be like, whoa, 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 am I rushing in just because that was my intuition? And should I look into either side? And the answer is almost always yes. Uh, and if you do that thoroughly, maybe with other people too, talk about it, uh, then you'll find you come to a much better conclusions, much more consistently. Doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's much better than just going with your gut feeling and, and explaining it afterwards uh, when it becomes a mess. All right, any questions about intuition? That's probably the longest one that I'm gonna talk about, but. All right, <clears throat> speaking of uh, uh, politics or <coughs> anything having to do with being right or wrong, <coughs> uh, people are pretty horrible at um, listening to information. So first of all, there's this intuitive bias where you 
have a feeling and then go with the decision and then try to explain it afterwards. But even if we have an argument about something, whether it's like an economic policy or immigration policy or, or an environmental policy, whatever it might be, um, even if you come to me with all this evidence and just blow me out of the water about why I'm wrong about climate change or immigration or whatever it might be, uh, what are the odds that I'm going to be like, oh yeah, good point, and then just adopt the uh, view you gave me? <laughs> Pretty low, right? Because there's two phenomena that, that prevent this, and this is absolutely entrenched in people, and sometimes you don't even realize you're doing it. Uh, the first one, and they're both related, but they are, they are different, uh, but they're, they're both very much part of uh, our human brains, is confirmation bias. So again, let's say uh, it, it, it's climate change or gun control or abortion, whatever. Pick your random topic that's you know really polarizing in politics. If I came to you with the alternate and I just had the best data ever and the best evidence ever, the odds that you would change your mind are almost nothing because uh, what you're going to do is you're going to dismiss, uh, even without thinking you're doing it, you're going to dismiss uh, evidence that goes against what you believe. And guess which ones you're going to hold on to? The ones that support it, right? And we all do this all the time. Uh, you either dismiss it as not relevant or not interpreted correctly, or you just don't recognize it at all. You just ignore it, uh, even though someone's like, "What about this?" And you're like, and you just kind of shrug it off and go to another point. That's confirmation bias. We're all guilty of this. Really, really, really guilty of this. All right. So uh, I think this is actually one of the more important uh, talks that I we can we can have here because you realize how these things can make you. Uh, can increase the probability you're making bad decisions. Uh, and once you realize these things exist and then they're really a part of your uh, nature and thinking, it's easier to not fall victim to them. Doesn't mean you're perfect, but like before I taught this class, you know, like five, six years ago, um, I was really guilty of all this just like all of you guys are. But now that I'm more aware of it, I'm able to catch myself more often when I do it. I don't get it all, no question, but I do a better job than I did like five years ago before I knew this stuff. So hopefully you keep that going forward with you. So that's confirmation bias. I automatically dismiss stuff that goes against my side and then I automatically will accept anything that uh, supports it. All right, even if it's shoddy, I don't care. As long as it supports my view and my group, then I'm, I'm probably gonna take it. And if it goes against, I'm gonna dismiss it or say it's not reliable or, or, or whatever, even though it might be. All right, so what will belief perseverance be? Like even Mm -hmm. still like cling on to like what you support and believe. Yeah, exactly. Even if I can't cling to anything else because there's nothing about my beliefs that are correct, or, or at least this part of my beliefs. Uh, not only do I dismiss it like the confirmation bias, but in this case, I just believe it harder. Just as hard or harder. It's actually sometimes called the backfire effect, where you totally trounce somebody and they got nothing in response. Like you can't say it's confirmation bias because they're not holding on to anything anymore. It's just all gone, right? And, but they'll still cling to their belief, and in fact, they might actually cling harder to it, uh, which is the backfire phenomenon. But yeah, that's belief perseverance. So that's, even though all of my, uh, <clears throat> all of the evidence points against what I'm saying, I still stick to my guns and, and, and believe it. Those all right. Earthers. Hmm? People that believe the earth is flat. Yeah, flat earthers would be a great example of that. <laughs> Anti-vaxxers are another great example of that. Yeah, you can think of a lot of things. That's, that's a great example of belief perseverance. It's like, they can't even hold on to anything for that one. The statistics across the board uh, throw both of those right out. Uh, that's just straight belief perseverance. Right, and then they'll come up with kooky things like, oh no, it's a big, it's a big uh, um, conspiracy uh, that's uh, run by the government or corporations or other organizations that somehow control and manipulate the entire population to believe in this thing that's not true and somehow control the information. It's just ridiculous. But anyways, <coughs> that's, uh, that's all of these things put together. Okay, what else is next? Oh, this is a, a, a common one. These are both common, actually. Uh, and this one can be dangerous, too, by the way. Uh, and humans are incredibly guilty of this. Uh, there's a phenomenon uh, referred to as representative heuristics. So humans are prone to stereotyping. That's basically what this is. So you have an understanding that, uh, I think I gave it a, did I give a dog example in there? Oh, the yeah, the pit bull, right? So uh, what's the reputation of pit bulls? They're aggressive, dangerous. Aggressive, dangerous, et cetera, right. 
Uh, and I think statistically they're pretty high up on the, on the aggressive, <laughs> violent uh, human interaction uh, chart. I don't know if they're number one, but they are up there, all right? Um, what about golden retrievers? Uh, yeah, they'd be on the lower end. Like everyone's like, oh, they're just these lovely family dogs that don't do anything wrong, and it's just a, they're not less less a border collie. What's a famous golden retriever? <laughs> was Old Yeller a golden retriever? I don't even remember. Was he? Yes. Yeah. Let's just say yes. I can think of like all the Air Bud. There we go. That's what I was there it is. Yeah. Okay. I was like, there's a, there's this dog in my head that's okay. Anyways, so uh, those are generally seen as like nice family dogs. Okay, fair enough. And if you and if you look at the statistic. If you look at the statistics, man, I can't say that very well. Um, you're probably right in that pit bulls might have more violent encounters than golden retrievers, but is it that gold retrievers are absolutely zero? No. no. Is it that uh, pit bulls are 100%? Mm -hmm. No. So what people fall into is this stereotype uh, trap, essentially. And don't think that think of yourself like, oh yeah, that's not me though. No, it's everyone. All right, uh, and it can be any type of stereotype. It can be racial, it could be based on your gender, it could be based on your political party and affiliation. Uh, what people tend to do is they try to understand people as a group and then what they do, and this is the, the danger in it, let's say you are a, a Republican, all right, and uh, I happen to be a Democrat and I think this about Republicans and they're stupid and wrong and evil or whatever, or vice versa, I could be a Republican and think the same thing about Democrat, all right. Um, what you'll actually find, though, is are all Democrats exactly the same? No. Absolutely not. Are all Republicans exactly the same? No. Absolutely not. Are all black people exactly the same? No. Absolutely not. Are all white people exactly the same? No. Absolutely not. Uh, and we know that for a fact. So what you run into the danger here is when you <laughs> judge somebody or an animal, whatever it was, a dog or a political affiliation or a race or a gender, right, because not all men are the same and not all women are the same by any means, uh, this error is when you attribute those stereotypical qualities to a person like right off the bat. Okay, so like uh, what are some typical like man stereotypes? Like oh they like football and they what else? They like cars and uh, they like to work all the time and things like that, right? Those are like stereotypes. So if I go to every single man I ever meet, are they all gonna have all those three qualities? Absolutely not, right? And you can do that about any stereotype for any group, all right? Even if it's somehow more common in this group or this group or this group, every individual in that group doesn't have those qualities, or not all of them do. Some of them might, some of them don't. So this error is when you judge somebody beforehand uh, based on your stereotypical understanding of that group. Uh, and again, don't just think dogs or just think race. It could be any category where people sort of have an idea of what this person represents, and so they lump those qualities onto the individual. Uh, because, we're going with the dog example, um, you can absolutely have like harmless family loving pit bulls that are not aggressive at all, right? They exist, look it up, there's plenty of videos of it, right? You can see plenty of people uh, around town. Can you find the aggressive ones too? Yeah. Uh, but you can do this <clears throat> same thing with the uh, golden retrievers. Or, or, or yellow labs, maybe is what I'm thinking of this, this particular dog. Let's say I said yellow lab. Um, there's uh, yellow labs are kind of seen as less aggressive too by most people. And there's this episode. You guys know uh, uh, Caesar Milan? Is that his name? Yeah. The guy that like the dog trainer, the super famous one. Uh, he's on South Park too. It's a hilarious episode. But uh, he's uh, he deals with uh, aggressive dogs and stuff. He'll go in and he has his little tactics he does, and a lot of times he can help the dog out. Um, one of them is this episode, it's one where he gets bit actually, one of the few ones where he just gets, this dog chomps his hand. Uh, and it ain't no pit bull, it's, a, it's either a golden retriever or a yellow lab, one of the two. Uh, and the, I remember watching it, however long ago, and the dog looks totally harmless, like a, just a happy dog or whatever, and you go up if he's eating, get close, and the dog just gnarls and like wants to attack you, like just kill you if you get anywhere near uh, uh, her or him in this food. And it's like, what? It like totally breaks your, you would picture like a pit bull or a wolf or something doing that, but not like this friendly looking family dog. All right, so uh, what this again is, is you're judging somebody based on a stereotypical view, but you're not giving them a chance to show that that's, that may not necessarily be them. Maybe they even have some of those qualities, but it doesn't automatically mean they have all of those qualities. All right, um, what could be another example? 
if a guy is walking around in a business suit with a briefcase in San Francisco, uh, he's probably a lawyer or a politician or some sort of business executive, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so he probably has a job, probably makes decent money. Is that necessarily true, though, with every individual? No, could it just be a guy in a suit with a briefcase that happens to be walking around? Right, might be an intern that doesn't even have a job, he's trying to get a job, right? So it doesn't mean that uh, uh, you, you, you can't instantly judge people based on, uh, or animals based on their stereotypes, because again, you've got to look at the individual case, all right? And that's a lot of the criticisms that people have of uh, people on the radical right or the radical left is that they tend to like view people as these groups, uh, not as individuals in those groups, all right? Okay. That's representative heuristics. So it's basically just stereotypes, judging people based on stereotypes. All right, got that? And that is an error because there are tons of cases where people don't match those stereotypes, uh, which is why you shouldn't just think uh, based on them. Okay, this one is also a big problem. Availability heuristic. Oh, by the way, the reason why we attach heuristics to these is because these are kind of like Educated guesses based on what you know, right? Because again, if I'm gonna go look for salsa, I don't start in the seafood section. I'm gonna probably start in the chips section or the Hispanic food section or whatever, right? Because that's where I would want to start. So this has to do with thinking based on educated guess uh, um, of, of what you know about the item or topic or whatever. Okay, so um, availability heuristic. This is what gets gamblers super, super bad. Uh, and this is a terrible human phenomenon. So I'll give you a gambling example, and I'll give you a, a, an example about violence. So why do people sit in front of slot machines all day, pulling these things so they run out of money? There's a chance they might get a reward. There's a chance they might get a reward. Yeah, OK, cool. Um, and uh, yeah, you could go with the, uh, uh, the uh, um, the variable ratio uh, 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 reward scheduling. And that, that, that's true because you can increase your chances of winning technically uh, by just doing more uh, uh, pulls. Uh, well, I shouldn't say, should say increase your chance, your chance is the same. But uh, if I do more lever pulls in a day, I'm likely to win more. Okay, cool. Um, but if I were to ask a gambler how often do they win, like percentage wise, like 1%, 50%, 20%, do you think they'd be very accurate? No, why not? Because everybody has a different chance of winning. No, you all have the same chance. Um, every time you go to a slot machine, it's the exact same chance, whatever it is. If it's like, I don't know, let's just say it's 2%. Uh, you might get lucky and pull a lever twice in a row and win twice in a row. But um, every time you pull a lever, it's just a 2% chance. If that's the percentage, I don't know what it actually is. So they're only really remembering the times that they did win rather Yes, okay. So this is what the availability, availability heuristic is. Uh, and I'll try to put it in words that make actual sense. Because when I first wrote about this a long time ago, it was like, uh, I kind of get it, but I kind of don't. This is the uh, error, the judgment error, that humans suffer from, where you assume the frequency or likelihood of an event, so winning and gambling, uh, is the same as how easily you can remember it, like how available the memory is to you. So let, let's say I go to a gambling, uh, a casino, a gambling building, a casino uh, for a week straight, and I, I go in there for eight hours, seven days a week. All right, let's say I win 10 times. Okay, am I gonna remember those 10 times? Probably, right, or at least most of them. Am I gonna remember the eight, other 8,000 times I pulled the lever and nothing happened? No, I'm not going to, okay? So in my mind, is it going to make it seem more likely that I win or less likely that I win? More likely that I win. Yeah, that's exactly uh, what the availability, availability heuristic is. So me thinking how, me thinking about the chance that it'll actually occur is ac not accurate. It's based on how well I can remember it. So if I remember the winnings a lot better, and I do, casinos make sure I remember those winnings better. Why do I remember the winnings more uh, than the losses in casinos? Anybody know? Yes, they do a bunch of stuff. Like, when I lose, do I hear anything? No. Nope. Is there any lights? No. Nope, other than like the one that just, so you can see it. But when I do win, what happens? 
like yeah. The alarm. The alarms go off, all the lights go off, like the money pours out, it makes that jingling sound and all that. And they even, it's so weird, they even do that sound when uh, it's electric. Like, like most of them have like cards now, you just put a, uh, an amount <coughs> on there, you know, win an amount. And they'll still make that coin sound even though there's not actually any coins falling out, which is hilarious. But they do that for a reason. They really want you to remember those times you won because that'll actually make it seem in your head like you win more than you actually do. All right, and they want you to think that because uh, then you'll go in and, and keep pulling the lever because you're expecting the next one uh, to, be, to be a win. Also, two people suffer from a thing called a gambler's fallacy, uh, which is they think that the more losses they have increases the chance that they're gonna win on the next hit. Is that actually true? It's not, right? If I have a 2% chance to win on the lever and I go 98 times without a, a win, does that mean that the next one's gonna be a win? Nope, it doesn't. It's still a 2% chance every time I pull the damn lever. All right, uh, that's availability here. Availability heuristic. Here's another example. This is one that was pointed out by a, a Stephen Pinker. He's a uh, professor at, is it MIT or Harvard? I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Harvard now. Uh, Stephen Pinker, he's a cognitive psychologist. He put together a bunch of information that showed how screwed up our image of the world is right now. So if I went out and asked people, and, and they did this, by the way, with thousands and thousands of people. They asked people, is the world getting better or worse? And they chose categories, all right? So I, there's a bunch of categories. I'm not gonna talk about them. There's like 20 or 30 of them. Let's just choose violence, all right? Violence in the world. Is the world getting more or less violent? Is it getting better? Is violence getting better? Is it improving, like reducing, or is it getting worse? Or is it staying the same? Uh, guess what's actually happening, by the way? Do you think it's getting better? It's getting, it's raining the same, or it's getting worse? Ooh, you guys don't quite know. Same, better, okay. Uh, and a couple, I don't hear any worse, but most people think it's actually getting worse or staying the same. Very few people, I think it was like 20 or 30%, maybe even less, said it was getting better. All right, so if I went back 100 years, do you think it was the same violence levels? Absolutely not, it was much higher. And there's tons of data to show that. Like he's got a, a bunch of graphs for different regions of the world at different times, different types of violence, like homicide, which is just murder, domestic violence and rape, which is of course uh, a violent act against an individual, deaths during wars, all kinds of de accidental deaths, all kinds of things like that. And he showed clearly, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you guys some graphs later, uh, probably tomorrow. Um, basically every single graph uh, goes like this. Um, if this is a, uh, uh, the total amount of carnage, and this is the uh, time that's gone, like this is now, and this is like the year 1500, or 1900, or because he uses a whole bunch of different data sets, or year uh, zero, whatever it might be. In every case, the violence always goes uh, this direction, which means decreasing. Like this is uh, a lot of violence, and this is little violence, and this would be, of course, zero violence. Uh, in all cases, whether it doesn't matter what a unit of time you're using, and again, he has a whole bunch of different ranges. Uh, it always, it's not a perfectly straight line either, by the way. Uh, it almost always, though, behaves like this, in a descending uh, pattern. There are little blips like, oh, okay, there's a, a war here, so it goes up a little bit, but then, you know, over time, uh, as societies uh, become more modern and uh, develop more uh, uh, complex and fair uh, political systems and police forces and uh, justice systems, uh, and things like that, and, and countries start interacting more uh, and trading more rather than fighting, uh, you see that this decline in uh, violence continues. But if you ask people if it's going up or down, they say it's the same where it's going up. Why would people say that when all the statistics clearly show it is going down? With, of course, little bumps here. But wh why would people think that violence is increasing or at least staying the same, even though it's absolutely going down by a lot? It is media related, yeah. So here's one of the uh, uh, reasons for that. And this is an, availabil an availability heuristic. Uh, if I watch the news, what kind of stories do I usually see? Good or bad stories? Bad stories, right. So there's actually two reasons for this. Number one, nobody ever uh, goes live from a city where nothing bad happens. Like, we're reporting here live today from Lathrop where everything's sunny and nothing's gone wrong. Like, they don't do that. What do they report? The bad stuff, the wars, the genocides, the riots, the school shootings, the terrorism, whatever, right? Um, so what that does over time is, since every day or every week you're seeing something, some new thing about, oh, a car bombing or a school shooting or a, uh, uh, 
some sort of violence in, I don't know, Rwanda or something like that, whatever it might be, or, or the uh, Syrian uh, crisis with the civil war over there. You see all these images uh, of these violent things. So in your head, it seems like that stuff's happening all the time. But everywhere else in the world, this stuff is not happening. I'm not seeing those things. So this is a, an, an example of the availability, availability heuristic error where we judge what's happening based on what we can easily recall. If I watch the news, there's a lot more uh, negative stories that stick out uh, as opposed to the positive stories. So that's availability heuristic, but also this too, and this is part of it. Uh, human beings are way more sensitive to negative events. So like, let's say I go, uh, I'm walking around, or no, let's say I put out a, a, um, a video or a picture on any of my social media, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be TikTok, it could be Instagram, whatever it is. You put it out there, someone likes it and gives a positive comment. It's like, that feels good, right? What happens though when uh, somebody leaves a nasty comment? Does it feel the same? No, which one is more intense? The nasty one, right? That's the one that'll bother you potentially. It'll, it'll stick with you that day. You'll want to say something back or wonder why or whatever. And in, immediately that, that positive one it just flutters away uh, as if it didn't matter. So not only since these stories are popping up because those are the ones people want to see along with the good ones, you actually remember the negative ones more thoroughly and that's a, that's a human, uh, um, that's a part of our um, brain essentially. Uh, and it's important too because we're more sensitive to negative emotion because it's much more dangerous. Like, think of it like this. If I had to make a list of ways that my life could get better today, would it be a super long list? It might be, actually. Hold on, let's, see. let's, say, let's not go length the list, but how much better could I make my life in one single day? Not a whole lot, right? The most extreme things are like, I win the lottery. I can't think of any other one major thing that would be like a life-changing event in one single day. All right, that's a pretty good one, all right? Uh, what, though, on your list could you write about terrible things that could happen to you? A lot more. A ton, right? And are they more severe or are they less severe? More They're more severe, severe right? Uh, so like the list of things that can make my life better in one day, relatively small. And even though uh, I can make a list maybe of things that are nice, like my life improvement doesn't like go up a thousand percent, it only goes up a little bit. But the wide array of things that can happen to you on a given day that are negative, that could affect you uh, greatly are, are huge. It could be anywhere from injury to disease to death itself to the loss of some, a loved one. Those would all hit you much harder than any little one thing that could make it better. So we're way more sensitive to negative things uh, and they're reported uh, as if they're happening all the time, even though if you look at the statistics, they're uh, declining substantially. So that's another example of this availability uh, heuristic bias. Does that make sense? All right, so you want to think gamble, you want to think violence, whatever, whatever helps you remember it. Let's, uh, let's take a break before I finish this up. Other examples of judgment errors. Um, this one is, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't call it intuition, but it's definitely something that can affect people. Uh, and this is the one, these are the ones you think of like, when you see those videos of like, usually guys, teenage boys or, or people that maybe have had too much to drink. Uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll feel like they can do something, like make that jump, or uh, uh, climb that wall, or something ridiculous, uh, land, that, uh, land that trick on, on their bike or whatever. Uh, and they feel like they can do it. And I, I know that feeling too, I've had that feeling before, like especially as a teenager, uh, and we'll talk about why later in developmental psychology, but basically uh, when you're a teenager, especially if you're a male and you got a whole bunch of testosterone flowing through you, you have this like feeling of invincibility, even though it has nothing to do with your actual ability. So it feels like you have the energy and the resolve to do something, even though it might be physically impossible or highly improbable. Uh, like, you know, going on a, on a, on a professional uh, motocross course when you have like no experience whatsoever on a dirt bike, you're just gonna crash and hurt yourself. Uh, or doing some ridiculous jump over like three garbage cans when you probably can't even jump over one. Like that's the kind of stuff that these, these guys think that they can do it and they can't. And it's not just guys, but it's definitely more so guys than not. Uh, but that's just blatant overconfidence. So you, you do have this feeling um, that you can do it. You feel energetic, you feel alert, you feel, feel confident, like, yeah, I can do this. But man, if, you have, if you've never done it before uh, or you uh, don't have any, well, just don't have any experience with it, if you, 
or not enough experience with it, it doesn't mean you can do it just because you feel like you can. This happens all the time when you, uh, there used to be a show called, uh, I think it was called Joe's versus Probes or something like that. It's an old show. Uh, but it was basically like when they would take these professional athletes and then there's these people that are like, oh, I could do that, whatever, like, you know, kicking a field goal 40 yards or whatever, or, or uh, knocking some guy out in a fight or uh, breaking a tackle or tackling a guy or whatever. And they would take these guys that said this uh, on Twitter or, or, or on the mail or, or on, on TV or whatever it would be, and they would actually get professional athletes and they'd have to actually try to do the thing that they said they could, like kick the 40 yard field goal or tackle the guy, or uh, get away from the guy who's trying to tackle you, or knock the guy out in a, in a boxing match, and like they just get smashed every single time. Because uh, they don't have the uh, actual knowledge or experience or expertise or power or fitness or anything like that to actually do it, uh, although they felt like after they watched it that they could get it done. All right, so that's overconfidence. It's when you feel like you can do something and you're convinced, but you don't have actually any evidence or experience or expertise to back that up, all right? Another one, last one I think, is one called framing. Uh, you can actually, this is actually similar to that misinformation effect thing uh, that Elizabeth uh, Loftus told us, uh, discovered. I can impact your perception and decision, or in her case, memory, based on how I word the question, correct? All right, and I think the example I give in the notes is something like this. Uh, let's say you uh, are diagnosed with uh, something that's a problem, kidney failure or something, or cancer or something like something terrible. And the doctor comes up to you and they're like, well, there is an experimental uh, procedure uh, where we go in and we, we try this new chemical. It's new uh, and it's got about a 90% success rate. Uh, as far as curing the person and, and, and sending them on their way healthy. It's like, okay, all right. Uh, could I take that same, same information and, and make you feel less optimistic about the outcome? Yes. I could, how? There's 10%. Yeah, I focused on the 90% success rate, right? And the way I delivered it was like, oh, it's like it's 90% success rate. And so more people were much more receptive to that than if I did the exact same thing I came in and said, well, we have this experimental procedure where we give you a new medication, new chemical, uh, and you have about a 10% chance of dying. How does that sound? <coughs> does it sound worse or better or the same? Worse. worse. Is it actually any worse or better? No. no. Is it the same? Yeah. It is exactly the same. But uh, my judgment and assessment of that is, is affected by the framing. How I frame the question, the words I use, the tone I use, uh, things like that can actually impact how people um, react to things and perceive them. And again, it's very similar to the, the Loftus example of causing people to remember things that weren't true based on the actual uh, framing and wording of the question. Like, use some more, more severe uh, uh, words, you get a more severe uh, memory. All right? Same effect. You guys got the framing thing down? Any questions about any of these? These are the two that confuse people the most uh, as far as what they are. And then these two often get confused. Like, they know what they are, but they they think it's the other term. These are the ones that people uh, often forget. So which one of these is my uh, judging people based on a stereotypical view that might not be <coughs> representative of them as a person? Representation. Representative. So what's availability then? It's not Steven Pinker. Like when you <clears throat> estimate like how, how likely something is an event is to happen based off of like what you can recall from your own memory. Yeah, how easily you can recall it, right? So the more easily I can recall it, do I think it's more frequent or less frequent? More frequent, more frequent right. Give me an example. Like if you're gambling, which, um, usually you remember, if you, keep, if you win a lot more times than a lot of other people, you uh, remember those more than the times that you lost. Right. And so uh, every, like if somebody asks you like something about gambling, you are gonna think about and remember the times that you won more. Why would I? You're right. Because you have more, um, because I, forget, I don't know how to explain that. Because you're right. Gamblers often uh, miss, or under, <coughs> not underestimate, they miscalculate how often they win. They think they win more often than they do. But why is that? So it is the availability heuristic, and you're right. The uh, availability of a memory increases the likelihood, I think, that it's going to happen or occur. Because the memory is so available to them, like whenever they do, like what you said with how 
the machines work, they make all this noise and there's... Yeah, exactly. Machines. They make it memorable. So it's easy to recall that memory, so it makes it seem like it happens more often than it does. Exactly. What's another example besides uh, gambling? So let's say you're playing like a different, like a sport, and the time that you win, that's the moment that you remember the most of mm -hmm. the sport. So um, if you lose, you're going to think back to the time when you won. I don't know if that works exactly because depending on the game, you're more likely to remember a major defeat than a major victory. Although, back in, like, further back in time, we actually have this like, a thing called a uh, um, nostalgia bias. So like, if I think back to uh, when I was a kid, it's mostly good memories, although there are some bad ones too, but people tend to think of like the good old days, especially adults. Because over time we have this like nostalgia bias, which makes us remember things better than they actually were. Um, so you could maybe say that, but I wouldn't say that would be a valid example. Is it like when you post something and there's a flood of like positive comments, but that one negative comment like sticks out to you, so you like kind of think what you're getting? Okay, that could work. Yeah, that that could work. Okay, but why does it work like that? Because like you um, were more sensitive to things that are negative than to things that are positive. Okay, uh, and how would that go with the availability heuristic? So frequent. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's and that's actually why celebrities get so gripped by these things. It's like, dude, you got a, a million positive things, like, and only thirty negative ones. But those thirty negative ones, they remember those. They stick out. A because we humans are more sensitive to negative emotion, uh, and then B it's it's that makes the memory more available. So it seems like it happens more often. Yeah, uh, we give you violence example too. You know, violence is on the decline by every marker. Uh, people think it's. Uh, more frequent or at least as frequent when it's actually not and that's because they remember them uh, and they report on the news more frequently because you don't report things that aren't happening uh, you report things that are uh, that are happening uh, and good things by the way another add to the note thing uh, to the news thing anything that's good takes a long time to develop like if we make some policy change like they make some I don't know tax reform or new law that changes the economy in some way, you don't notice it that year or the year after. You notice it after like 10 years. Like, oh wow, look, the economy grew and we got a, a lot better with our lives. But there was no one day where you'd be like, look at how good it did today. Like, those don't exist. Uh, but if something bad happens, like a, a stock market crash or a housing market crash, it's like, boom, everyone knows exactly when that happened. Uh, and then uh, they're able to recall it. Okay.